the fact that um, Canada does its review the way it does has actually brought a lot more biopesticides to Canada in the most recent years. Because Health Canada looks at the efficacy of products while the US does not. So it has become a marketing tool. Having a registration in Canada has become a marketing tool for biopesticides in the US. Registered in Canada, every US grower knows Health Canada has looked at efficacy. Registered in Canada, it works. So there are always those remaining 10%, right, of information to be provided in a data package. One of those is genetic characterization. That you will have to do. So what you do is you take a virus sample, nicely clean, send it to some lab that does DNA work on a routine base. A week later, they send you back um, their interpretation of the genetic code of your virus, and then you have it for your data package. Gets cheaper and cheaper every day. Not a big deal anymore. You don't need the whole code of the virus. You just need some very specific sequences that are characteristic for bacterial viruses. And those analytical labs, they know that. You can just send that out. It's easy. Did you find it, Chuck? Yeah. Oh, could you open it, please? So genetic characterization. One other thing that they want to know is, is your virus indigenous or is it alien? What I would do is, I would say it's alien. Because then you get a complete list of data requirements. And you yourself can then scratch out the things that only apply to alien vacuolar viruses. Because if you have an indigenous one, those items you don't have to be addressed. You don't have to address. What you do then is simply in your document, in your data package, you say under item, I don't know, um, 3.2.8 uh, origin, then you say indigenous. And each time later in the data package, when they ask for a characterization of the virus, you simply say, doesn't the reply refer to 3.2.4? and then the evaluators know. It's again a question just of providing the information. Jack, could you scroll kind of really, really down towards the end? Mm -hmm. No, that's too far at the end. That's a little higher. It's a lot of words that, yeah, OK, a little higher still. No, still higher. Uh, yeah. Mnel index there. No, that <coughs> That's is the first one. Okay, you'll get something like this. <coughs> Forget about that part. You don't want to know. You have the data code in the first column. In the second column, you have the name of the study. And they are categorized in. Um, well, the label, the chemistry, the health, what you see missing here is DACO3, that only applies to chemicals. Um, exposure, that is human exposure, when you apply the product or so, right? Um, food and feed residue studies for bacterial viruses that will not be triggered. Nobody will ask you for anything there. They will ask you for environmental fi fate. No studies. Now, if you if you would have now the electronic version of it, and you would click on env an environmental fate, you would probably come get a list of 20 or 30 information items they are asking for. All those have been written up. That's what I meant earlier with published literature. You find all this in published literature. Just send them that with kind of a summary on top saying, OK, if you read this and this and this and this and this article, your conclusion will be da 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 Most likely, the evaluators already know that. They are scientists. Environmental toxicology, same thing. Value. There's, again, something where you will have to do some work. 
That is where you show efficacy. That means your field trials go in there, the results of your field trials. But what also goes in there is a text that you write up, what is the economic advantage to the growers? What is the environmental advantage to the public? What is the human health advantage to the consumers? Put it in there, because all that has an effect to the value of your product. Um, in the part two, product characterization, product characterization and analysis. That includes your production method. That means you have to show to Health Canada how you produce your virus and how you do quality control. Quality control, Health Canada is not so worried about the virus because it's a bacular virus, it's a bacular virus, it's a bacular virus. It does nothing other than to the target insect. But you need to make sure that there's nothing in there that might be toxic to the environment or to people. So let's look at the production system first, and then let's see what to do about quality control. That was it. Can you close the screen again, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. has always been like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, production. Let's do this together. I mean, my brain is slowly fading a little bit. The T3 effects here are coming through. Um, what do you need to produce? What are the costs? Where are the costs? So just start thinking. What do you think you need? Okay, we need a virus. Yes? A virus. And yes, we need a colony. Absolutely. What else do we need? Packaging. Hmm? Packaging. packaging, absolutely. Once we are done producing, we need packaging. So that would be part, who said that? It would be part of the facility? I mean, once you go really industrial, um, Deborah will kick you out. You need a new facility. <laughs> Staff, exactly. What about the customers? Absolutely. <laughs> Marketing, right? And then? You don't need Emma and Jack anymore. There's one more thing you need. You need a distribution system. Because you need to ship the stuff and somebody needs to pay you at the end. So you, you had equipment and diet mentioned? Yes. yes, that's true. It's not really facility, that's true. Um, how did we call them? Consumables, right? Is it fine with you if we call all these consumables, the containers, the diet, so on? Are the students part of consumables? No, they fall under staff shock. <laughs> So the only thing we know so far right now we, from this morning is we do have a virus. So that's a good thing. Huh? Well, you do. Right. You, so you do have a colony in the lab. But now let's make a calculus. So let's say you have a virus that you can produce in an L5, whatever the insect is, and your L5 can produce something like, I don't know, 10 to the 6 particles. Now you need to know how many L5s do you need to treat a hectare? Because you need to know how many virus particles you need to treat a hectare. So let's say you have a virus that is efficacious at 10 to the 9 particles. 
how many larvae do you, L5s, do you need to treat one hectare? You all forgot your math. That means you need 10 to the 3 larvae. One, oops, 1,000 larvae to treat one hectare. At L5, they eat a hell of a lot until they reach that stage. Good news is that most L5s produce more than 10 to the 6, so you might actually just need 100. And the production cost of your insects very much depends on the insect biology. So let's say you want to treat, but let's continue with those numbers. It's, it's cautious, right? So you need 10 to the 3 larva per hectare. And now you need to have a market. Let's say we do coddling moth. How much hectares are there of, of, of apple and pear production in Canada, approximately? I'm not sure even anymore. But I think it's 15,000 hectare. Most likely, you won't be selling to all of them. But then maybe you need four treatments in a year then you are not anymore at 15,000 hectares to be treated, but 60,000 hectares to be treated. If for each of those 60,000 hectares, you need 1,000 larvae, you need 600 million larvae. That's a hell of a lot of lava, and I would suggest that does not work over there in the facility. <laughs> Good news is you will not get the whole market the first year. <laughs> you will probably never get the whole market because you won't get everybody away from chemicals. But even the ones who don't get away from chemicals, we find now that more and more growers think, you know what, if the biologicals don't hurt, might as well apply them together with the, bio with the chemicals. And they actually do that. It's a different interpretation of IPM, but it, it's, it's happening. <laughs> so you really need a lot, a lot, a lot of larvae. You could. Coddling moth, you could, yeah. What, what we have done, so first of all, production how do you want to produce? You don't sell all year round. You only sell during the summer. So we said, OK, let's say there is 160 days where we market. And we produce 200 days per year. So then we knew how many thousand of larvae we needed to infect every day. So if you have, I don't know, let's start with any kind of, of number. Let's say you need 10 million larvae in a year to infect in a year. And you have 200 days that you do that. Then you take those away. Now we are at what? We're at 100,000 divided by Five. two. Uh, huh? Five. So you have to infect, is that true? 50,000 a day. That's a lot. What do you mean with attrition rate? That you lose some lava along the way? Yeah, Absent. That comes now. You have 50,000 that you need to infect in a day. What mortality do you have in your colony? Absolutely. Plus, you need to keep your colony going. <coughs> if you infect all the larva, you have no adults anymore. So you really need to have a very clear calendar of what has to happen on each and every day in a given week. And then against that calendar, you need to plan your staff. Because remember this morning what I said? Do not have one person that works in the colony work on the viruses. Not good. You just get very high mortality in your colony, and there goes up your production cost. So what you really do is you create a table where you list all the different activities that have to happen, which means cooking the diet, filling it into the containers, 
cooling the containers, storing the containers. Then it would probably be getting the egg masses out of the cages, putting them on the diet that you have cooked three days ago. Now it had three days to settle before you put the eggs on it. How many days does it take for those larvae to hatch? How long can they stay in the box? That again will depend on the individual species. You have to figure that out. And yes, you learn a lot while you do the research in the lab. But how they really behave in your production facility, you will always have to figure out. Because humidity is different, temperature is different, and I swear they go by the moon and some things that we are not aware of at all. Some things just absolutely, they work at the one place and they don't work at the other. So, to produce enough codling moth virus for Canadian and US apple market, and I don't remember anymore what market share we aimed for. I, I really, it's, it's not that I'm pretending this, I really forgot. Five. Five what? Percent. Five percent was the first year, but we didn't build the facility only for one year. I think the maximum we hoped to have was something like 30 percent of the total market. The facility that we built cost $1,500,000. That's money you first have to raise. Very crucial moment. This is the time when you really want to take a course in finance and an investment. And I, I really, I mean that. If we would have done that, maybe we could have protected ourselves better. The point is that we had found people who we felt were really safe investors. They invested government money for government. We figured that this is safe, absolutely that is safe. What we didn't know was that these same investment groups did not only receive money from government, but also from different industries, from different big companies. And you do not look behind. You meet with this person and that person and that person, but not with the person behind and the person behind and the person behind. So you really do not know. But to understand those things, you need to have a minimum understanding of investment. So that at least you can have a colleague who works with you, who is a specialist in investment, and you are able to talk with him. That colleague will bring financial expertise, you will bring scientific expertise, but if you don't understand a little bit of each other, you can't even talk with each other. You'll sit together and your adrenaline will flare up each time you sit together because we think the other one has just no clue and has no idea. And it's really, you need to understand a minimum of it. Facility, staff, for to produce codling moth, virus, we realized we needed 10 people, of which six were working on the colony. No, actually, four were working on the colony, four were working on infection, and two were working on packaging and distribution. So in all, we had 10 people. Um, some jobs don't ask for so much education. So you could say, OK, it's a cheaper person. On the other hand, if you have a team where some people are very highly qualified and others really not, you get, again, the same kind of human conflict in the system where somebody in your team is not fully engaged. I must say, in Madagascar as well as in Burkina Faso and in Quebec and in the prairies, we always kind of had the cleaning lady take the lead on many of the activities that we had. She had to give presentations to the whole team about every two months it was her job to hold the weekly seminar because she saw where contamination could happen. For that we needed to teach her a bit about insects and we needed to teach her a bit about viruses and she had to learn it. And then she was able to put the finger on the scientists and on the technicians to say, honestly, do you realize each time you pass there, you touch? It's these little things that you need to be aware of. Because while you do your work, you cannot think to all the details. And again, it affect, affects your production cost. Let's say you have an average salary of 
Okay, it's not something that we could pay, but let's say you have an average salary of 40,000, and not everybody works full time. Then let's say you have an annual budget of $400,000 uh, per year for your staff. Now comes the difference in thinking, right? This is a one-time expense. This is an annual expense. When it comes to your consumables, what do you need? You need the diet ingredients. You need the containers. You need the egg sheets. What else do you need? Right, and there is something I forgot. The facility itself is a one-time investment, but then you need to go, you need electricity, you need water, you need air conditioning, you need maintenance. Huh? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah if you buy the building, right? If the building is yours. Um, so consumables, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot more. Those are typically daily expenses because you will have daily production batches. So this is something you use every day, you make every day, <coughs> you throw out every day. Um, producing the virus is really the cheap part. You take your containers with all the larvae that you have ready to be infected. We here assumed L3, did we? Yeah? I don't remember. Well, on codling moth, we did L3s. So when, they were, when, the, when the larvae in the pot had reached L3, then we had them transported over to the other building. That was a job. Remember here, I just said not everybody works full time. That was a separate job for somebody. So every day somebody came, took all the ready boxes with lava, and walked them out. The building that we had actually had one entrance here and one entrance there, and a big separation here. So every day somebody took the trays from here, walked them over here, brought them there, and then went home after. We did not want the people who work here to carry the trays over here. And we did not want the people who work over here come around and pick them up. Were we over careful? I don't know. But this is a serious investment. That money you need to get back in. Fine, not in one year, but over several years. And yes, you can. But you do not want to take the risk. And when you talk to investors, they want to know how you address the different risks. Can they be addressed? Yes, you just have to know how and you have to be able to explain. So this one was a good explanation. Um, so now you have brought them all over here. You, have, you open your container. You have a spray bottle. You spray in your virus. Now it's not anymore like we did in the lab system this morning where you take individual caterpillars drown them, halfway drown them in the liquid, pick them back out, put them into solo cups, no such thing. You take the box, open it, <laughs> spray the virus suspension in, put them aside. Several hundred boxes every day. Then they go back into the incubator, big incubator rooms, and they just sit there. How long do they sit there? Investors calculate production cost by cubic meter times time, or cubic foot in Canadian, for Canadian investors, I guess, over time. So if your larva have to sit in the incubator for 10 days, that is less expensive than if they have to sit in there for three weeks to produce virus. Make sense? Cubic meter times time, number of days, that's the cost it takes you to run your facility. 
right? Every day this facility is going, you spend electricity, water, air conditioning, maintenance, and your staff. So you want to shorten it as much as you can. That is something that the people who walked away with our company were not as smart as they thought they were. They thought we can shorten these production, this production time you know, to, 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 to reduce production cost by shortening production time. What happened was that the viruses they marketed in the third year that the product was registered was not anymore the virus with a capsule around being protected from environmental influences, but it was only the, vi the virus itself. They didn't give the virus the time to encapsulate. That means you put it out there, you spray it out there, the virus does nothing. So it's really important to find that timing. How, do you, how can you push the step from here to there? By stressing the lava. So there is, for example, that there are people who think, OK, you know what, I have infected the larva, and two days or three days later, the whole thing looks really messy. Let's change those larva onto fresh diet. Well, now you have more consumables, you have more time, and you need to pay your staff an additional step. On top, what happens is that the larva can defend themselves very, gain, very well against the virus. And you again push towards this instead of this. Actually, when it begins to look really yucky and the larvae die and turn black, that is when they start putting the capsid around the virus. Again, a question, find the right moment, find the right timing, the right temperature, the right humidity, depending on the insect species, the diet they eat. And this needs to be figured out. And it needs to be figured out at the right place. But the way that Jacques and I look at baculoviruses is a little bit like a cook. Just because you can download recipes for tomato sauce from the internet doesn't necessarily mean you are going to make a good tomato sauce that would attract customers into your restaurant. Running a restaurant takes a lot more than a recipe off the internet. And so it's really what you can provide as a team that gives you a useful, uh, successful product. Very different from big business concept. Yes? So I was just thinking about the efficacy and I guess for registration you have to do the field trials. Yes. So, um, so how do you go about getting a permit or something to, to use it before it's registered? Same website that we looked at earlier to find out about the, the, um, consulta uh, the registration requirements. There is a link to the permit and you fill in that application. And again, if you fill it in for baculoviruses, it's fairly simple. If you come in with a completely new idea, it's more difficult. Deborah? Just a comment about that. There are two levels of it and there's a nice level called if you're working with a native uh, microbial or biopesticide, and in the geographical zone that it came from, if you don't require a permit to do a field trial, you require a notification. And if you want to do it on a site that's not yours, uh, for instance, for the last two years, we've done off-continent site field trials with the Med Museum and the Tribal Nervous. And we, the nice thing about it is that the grower, in the case of this year, wrote a letter saying they gave us total control of the site for the duration of the trial and signed it, and that was as good as having it on our site, and our, our permit was a two-week turnaround. Not a permit, notification, it was a two-week turnaround. See, already the difference between a permit and a notification. This is when it comes kind of, okay, time to inscribe for a legal course. It's not that you want to become a legal expert, you don't want to become a lawyer, but having a minimum understanding with people who do this kind of stuff helps you to make it happen. Even just being able to assign the task to somebody means you have a minimum understanding. So then, yes. Can you? Take it off? Yes, please. I don't know if it will work. 
off. I know. Off. <laughs> so you have to push on it. It doesn't obey me. That would have been nice now, eh? <laughs> It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay, what do we do? I don't know. Pull the plug. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, Jacques, while you play with the button. No. Oh, nice. So, we have our production cost. Now, before we can start packaging, we need what we call quality assurance, QA. So first thing you need to do is write all this up. Best thing of a production description is a flow chart. You know, do this, do that, do this, do that. Come from here, come from there, carry this over there. Put it all into a flow chart. It is something that evaluators can follow the best. Plus, most likely you won't be doing it all. So if you have a team of people who will be doing the production, it's really helpful if they have a flow chart hanging somewhere in their facility where they can see step after step after step how they have to do it. And you can even put all the wash hands, wash hands, wash hands in between. It's important. People fall into routines and every once in a while they need a reminder. Plus Health Canada will give you a permit more likely if they see that you have thought to it. Um, so that was production quality assurance. What do you look for in your quality? What makes the quality of your product? It works. Hmm? It works. Great idea. Absolutely. So if you say, so you were in your description for your data package, quality assurance, you will write up something on how you want to make sure that the product is going to work. So if you say, OK, once a year, we'll run bioassays in the lab to make sure the virus still works. And you say we have a 1-800 number, and we take the responses from the growers and react to those, you have addressed efficacy in your quality assurance part. What else might be a concern for Health Canada? Contamination, absolutely. What are they worried about? Not about the baclovirus. What they are worried about is what you might have here on your diet, either in your viral production or in the production of your colony. Our hands are not always clean, right? Take your hand as it is right now, dab it on some agar and come back in two days. You'll be grossed out by everything that has been growing on your hand. Same thing here. There is stuff growing in there cannot prevent that at all. But that doesn't mean PMRA is worried about it. As we said this morning, yogurt, cheese, many different food products, lots of pathogens everywhere. They don't do anything to us. We aren't scared of them. But what we are really scared of are the human pathogens. Or Health Canada is, and I guess representing us they are. What we have done for our products is that we said, wait a minute, what would be the safest thing to compare our product to that Health Canada would accept? Well, it's a water-soluble product. It's an aqueous suspension. Drinking water comes to mind. So we looked at the standards of drinking water. You can find them on the internet. And we have always compared our product to drinking water. There are two ways now to make sure that your product does not contain anything that drinking water does not and also at a concentration that is lower than that that is allowed for drinking water. We simply didn't want to have any challenges, so we wanted to make it extra safe. Two ways of doing it. Analytical labs, hospital labs, um, little clinics left and right where you go for blood tests and things like that. You can bring them a sample, a daily sample of your product, daily production, um, production batch. 10 years ago, it cost $50 per sample. For us, that was added to the production cost that we had. So it was all this plus 50 bucks. If they sent back to us the report of what is in there, there was nothing in there that is not standard for drinking water, then for us, 
it was ready to be marketed. If there was something in there, it never happened, but the theory was that if there would be something in there that would be of concern, that would be unacceptable for drinking water, we would throw the batch out. As we had 200 production batches a year, was no problem in increase the number of pots you put or the, the, um, that you produce in your colony for a few days and you have caught it up. So again, flexibility if you are a small company. And for the registration, all they want is the results of five batches. Yeah, that's the famous five batch analysis where you will find people who will tell you that costs at least $1 million, while in fact you get it for 250. So there's a lot of rumor going on about costs associated to things. And um, always check your facts yourself. Another way to check it, and we discussed that yesterday in the lab, um, there are nowadays, similar to the ELISA trays, you can get trays with 20 or 24 grooves that are pre-treated with um, immuno, and immuno, 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 not enzymes, immuno, well, with antibodies for different uh, pathogens that are already on there. And what you do is at the end of the day, you take your production batch of the day, you know, a little bit into a pipette, put a little bit into each and every of the grooves that you have there, put it in the fridge overnight. Next day, you put it into a scanner that has different light um, sources in there. It's connected to a computer. And depending on the light that is projected on the tray, you get different kinds of reflection. And the computer analyzes that and give, prints you out your report of yesterday's production batch. Same system again. There's something in there of concern. Throw out the batch. You know, don't, don't argue, don't purify. It's really, this is no point that is a lot more expensive. Plus, if you want to argue it, you need to go back to Health Canada and argue it and need to convince them that your secondary purification system not only works, but also that you really apply it each time. Too much of a hassle, don't do it. So quality assurance. Those are the three parts in a bacterial virus data package that have to be addressed. You have to characterize your virus. Remember, for that, you send it out. Um, you have to have your production system. Well, you learn how to produce over time. If you need to make a change in your production system down the road, let's say you get a registration today, and during the next uh, production year, you find, oh, man, there's a much better way of doing this. Take the chart, send it to PMRA, ask them, OK, can we just you know, replace the one by the other, or do you need to assess it? Most likely, they will say, that's fine. We'll replace it. You are done. Cost you nothing. And the third was the quality assurance. So those are really the things that have to be done, plus, obviously, the field trials and efficacy. When it comes to baculoviruses, the whole rest is already written. Don't finance any more studies. Done. And the rest, just rapidly, is what we call the six-pack. It's uh, oral acute, you know, that, we, that is done oh, yes. with rats. Uh, it, you don't have to do those studies anymore. Yes, that would, that would add another $50,000 of, of expenses, if not more, even a little more nowadays. But uh, acu oral acute, inhalation, so they force rats to inhalate your, your, your virus. Ocular treatment, uh, dermal, so they, they all with rats or mice. Uh, so, at the total, inhalation, oral acute, uh, chronic, and dermal, six. We call it the six pack. And once that's done, and it has been done with so many baculoviruses now, that you just do your literature search and write a, a one pager or two pagers that link all those articles together that say, guys, this has been a zillion times, you don't say it like that, but demonstrated that it is safe. And that's it. You don't have to do any studies. Because studies, yes, they do cost. There, there is a nu nuance to it, Jack. Um, it's true they are not worried anymore about the baculoviruses. They know they don't do anything. But they are not sure about what the insect produces. Maybe people are allergic to the, what the insect produces. 
So PMRA might still get back to you and say, you know what, we really want to have a dermal irritation study. And then they take a poor rabbit and they shave, or, or guinea pig, and they shave its belly and they rub some of your product on it. Actually, you do that. You find yourself a lab that does it. This kind of study needs to be GLP, means good laboratory practice. Um, there are only certain labs across Canada that are GLP certified. You can find the names of these companies on the website. So the idea is you ask PMRA for the protocol of the study, take the study, send it to, the comp to three or four companies, said, please send me a quote. They send it back. You know, it's not different than, I don't know, replacing the roof or, or, or the sink or, or any renovation on your house. Same process. No point in starting that yourself. And then we come to this last part, packaging, marketing, and distributing. Packaging. You have two options when you talk about an aqua suspension. There are plastic bottles and there are glass bottles. <laughs> glass bottles, very fragile, very expensive, very heavy when we think of shipping, but they don't definitely will not interact with the product in the bottle. Plastic decays over a certain amount of time. So what I would do is definitely, or maybe in the first year, go for glass, but then the years after, go for plastic. Now, if you go in a catalog of, of um, Fisher instruments, you'll find many different types of plastic. You do not know which plastics interact how. Ask the companies. They typically have an idea of what works well. What I would do is always use something that's brown to protect the virus from UV light. That's a good idea. Um, however, if you keep the bottle in a carton box or tell the grower to put it in the fridge or so, you know, you're fine too. So there's always different ways of dealing with it. What you have to do in terms of registration and packaging is you need to tell the agency how you package and why do you package this way. And what the agency would want to know is something like storage stability. You know what your virus, what your suspension can support and how to store it and all this. But Health Canada does not know. So they want to know what you are saying on your label and why you are saying it. What you do is you, once you have decided for which plastic bottle you want, because it's also a question of price, right? You don't want to go for maximum safety, which comes with maximum price, but you want to go for a level of safety that you need to have for a price that's acceptable, get, I don't know, ask for 20 bottles, put in each bottle some of your product, put them somewhere at room temperature on a shelf. And then for the next uh, 10 months or five years, whatever you want, in regular intervals, you take a sample out and you run the test, make sure nothing has grown in there that you didn't want to have and you run a bioassay to show that the virus still works. And this is just at the beginning of your production system. The first time when you apply for registration and you have to say what the storage stability of your product is, you'll probably just say three months because you simply haven't tested it any longer than three months. But then three months later, you go back to PMA and say, okay, we have uh, tested for six months now. Remember, it's always the first 10 bottles you have out there. So then you can come back and say, please change this to six months. We now have the data for six months. And then you do nine and 12. So it grows over time. And you definitely don't need more than two years anyway, because growers won't store it any longer. They only buy for a year. They don't buy for years ahead. Marketing. Our experience was, our best marketing was strategy was not to talk about the product. The point is that the growers among themselves, they communicate very well. It was our ability to increase production that was more impacting on the reputation of our product than the talking to the growers actually did. The only worry about our product that the growers ever had was if we would be able to provide it to them. Right? You can have a fantastic product, but if you can't deliver because you can't produce or because you go belly up or whatever, 
you know, then the product is not interesting to the grower. What happened the very first year is we got registration beginning of July, which is really late for the first treatment in the season. And we, didn't, we hadn't planned to distribute. But there are growers, scientists, grower associations, Apple marketers, um, Apple sauce or juice producers who monitor the websites of EPA and Health Canada for new products that come online. They saw our product being registered when government announced it. And the next day, they sent us in order forms that they had designed themselves. We hadn't thought of order forms or anything like that. We didn't even have a website where somebody could download an order form. They just, you know, I don't even know how they got a fax number at the time everybody did fax. <laughs> so we, we, we got all these order forms coming in and we knew you must not go back to the grower and say, I'm so sorry, I have a great product. I don't have any right now. That's bad marketing. You don't want to say that. So everybody that worked for us in the lab, scientists, you know, the PhDs we had, the, the cleaning ladies, everybody sat around and just packaged our research stock. We just make sure we had enough to actually in the fall then really start producing big time for the year after. But that first summer, it was a mess. Really, it was a mess. It was really, really difficult. But we succeeded. Distribution. Um, you can distribute through FedEx systems like this directly from your company to the grower. It's more expensive. We found it more useful to ship it to distributors. There are distributors of pesticides out there who market into the apple industry or into the canola industry or into the wine industry, or no, this would be a grape industry, into the grape industry. Um, if they buy it, then you can send them big boxes and they distribute locally. Good thing is that then also they have somebody, the growers have somebody they can talk with. So that's the only marketing we ever did. So for now, don't even think about it. Chances are that people hear about your product long before you're even meant to tell them. Yeah. And, and how you decide what to put in the formulation? Um, formulation really has two things, right? One is you might want to give your virus an extra protection against UV light, the one thing. <coughs> Some people actually might want to give the um, product a taste so that the insect goes for it more likely. And then there is, again, storage stability. You might have some bacteria in there that um, eat the diet leftovers very well and you might get a fermentation process in your bottle and then after some month maybe not being kept cold you know your whole body your whole bottle <laughs> explodes <laughs> so you want to prevent that there's a varieties of ways to address uh, each of those three concerns for us um, the idea of having to render the product more tasty to the insect, we didn't feel that was necessary at all. For us, this was somewhat, I don't know. These viruses exist everywhere. They exist forever. They are quite successful in a, in a working ecosystem to control insect populations. We didn't think we needed to make it any more tasty than it is. Plus, our efficacy tests showed that the product worked very well, even when it was not formulated. So we didn't put anything there. We got a lot of pressure from investors to formulate the product because they felt a good formulation you can patent. Well, as we didn't feel we wanted any patenting for us, that wasn't really an argument. Um, so we didn't formulate for taste. Um, sun, UV light protection, there's a variety of things that have been tried, going all the way from milk powder, which I find ethically very, very, very challenging, uh, over to the whiteners that are used for bleaching paper. Mix that in. Again, for me, I mean, I definitely wouldn't use milk powder. I'm absolutely sure about that. This, this, this bleaching products, 
I mean, we didn't do it. So maybe that's the way I should explain it. We didn't do it. Why didn't we do it? Because we felt if we apply it at the right time, in the right way, the virus didn't need additional protection. It did def the product didn't need additional cost. And the environment definitely didn't need additional stress. But then maybe you know we are a little bit obsessed about environmental protection. I don't know. Maybe that's an argument. But we just didn't see the need to do it. But there are ways, and you can find it in the literature, how to do that. What is important, though, is um, formulate against um, um, some funny growth in your bottle, in your product. And there's also two different strategies. Well, or three. One is don't formulate at all. Just keep it cool. Tell the growers to leave it at four degrees in the fridge or less. Another one is to um, purify your virus. Some people actually really run their product again on the gradient and then only take the virus and resuspend it to the right concentration for application. But now you have the virus with nothing else in the water and now it's really susceptible to anything. Now you would probably have to add um, whitener, not milk powder. Um, another way is just to add something that prevents the growth of pathogens, of bacteria, of fungi that you don't want to have. And there you find all sorts of things in the food industry. I wouldn't go for chemical preservatives. We have had very good experience with a certain concentration of salt. Remember, people have used salt, you know, salted meat and salted this for, for, for forever. Uh, pathogens tend not to grow very well on salt, but you really want to look at the right concentration of it because you might seriously change the pH of your product and that can harm the virus. Plus, you need to look at what is the insect you want to treat, what is the plant, the biology of the plant it grows on, and what is the application timing. If you can protect your virus in a different way, Spray at the end of the day, right? That's, for example, what we did with rice. The insect set in the leaf sheet, sheath, set right in there. And if we applied the virus by the end of the day, it just overnight, it just ran in there. And there it was totally, you know, totally protected from UV light. And when the insects would come, even a week, two weeks, three weeks later, they crawl in there. And then they make a hole into the stem to then live inside the stem. So we had basically created for them a virus barrier where the, where the virus is protected from sunlight and the insect has to swallow the virus to make it into the stem. So again, here comes the complexity of biology, which is an advantage to any small company. You all looked a little bit spaced out now. <laughs> A lot of stuff I've been throwing at you. Do you have any more questions? Should we take a few minutes break and then do the remaining parts? The very last thing is, what does it cost what, in that system that you described for Kalima? What was the cost oh. of your product per hectare? Yes. The production and everything else? And how much did we ask to cover the cost and make profit? Yeah. So the whole cost over to here. No, 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 no. The whole cost over to here <coughs> was 10, oops, $10 the hectare. Add packaging, add, well, we didn't have to add marketing. Um, add distribution, which means the shipping cost. Made the product $40 per hectare. We figured, you know what, we'll charge $50 the hectare. And then this difference of $10 per hectare, that would be a profit. We didn't figure, you know, we wanted to accumulate profit somewhere. We were not an investment organization. We didn't have stakeholders or shareholders to pay off. This difference in $10 then went into the development of the next products. Remember, we had nine viral banks. This was just the first one. We needed to finance the mm -hmm. research for the other eight and everything else that came after. 
what you would find is that growers come with more and more and more insects that they would really like you to work on. And everybody feels, obviously, that their insect pest is the most important. And it is. It is. They stand in front of their field, and they see this insect chewing away on their crop. It is the most important one. Then what happened? We got investors. No, they don't think this way. They don't come from up here. They come from here. And they look into, OK, what's the market willing to spend? All the calculus they did, what is the loss that the growers have? How much do they spend of chemicals? What is the, the, the potential value of apples when they are organic apples? Where can they export them to the Japan, to the UK? Higher profit on apples? They do all that analysis. Lots of their work, tens of thousands of dollars into consultants. And they came up with $240 the hectare. That's what the growers would be willing to pay. For us, this was, this was not ethical. This was not socially viable. This was not good for the environment or for the economy. For us, it was. So I started arguing. I was the president of the company. I was supposed to argue this stuff. and. Um, I think I did great. I thought I did great. Because I argued them to $160 a hectare. Can you imagine how many sleepless nights I had over accepting that? But it was either that or no facility. That no facility means no product at all. So I finally agreed on this, thinking I had done well. I hadn't. It became very clear that the moment I forced them to agree on that, they decided to get rid of me. And uh, <laughs> so was it smart to argue the point? I don't know. I think, I think it was. I mean, I couldn't have lived with that. That's as simple as that. Well, what are you telling me for now? I have not checked. I don't know. Most probably. I because they are willing, the growers are willing to pay for it. It was quite painful to go through all this. Um, it's, it's quite a challenge. And I think it was so much of a challenge because we didn't get the kind of training you guys, for example, got today. We just started the way we started this morning, right? We took our three kids and the van, and we went out into the field, and we collected insects. We didn't have a strategy. Yes? Um, you mentioned that you um, what's, how do you plan for the cross-contamination and other challenges in that environment? Uh, well, no problem at all. <laughs> what we did there is, so everything like we said this morning, but then when it comes to this part, um, we didn't, we, we figured, okay, can, um, and you might not know that, but Madagascar is one of the poorest countries in the world. At the time when we lived there, it was always either first, second, or third poorest country. Now they are position 11, 12, a little better. But uh, probably just because we shifted the ways we established these values. Um, the growers don't have the means to buy anything for pest control. So for us, it was clear they needed to have a way to do it themselves. The only thing they have is their own hands. And whatever they can do themselves, they can do but they have no buying power. They can't go and buy a product. So the system we developed there is take the viruses, produce a certain amount in the lab, enough that you would need uh, to distribute to growers across the country. So in this case, we didn't go by hectare, but we went by grower group, basically by village. And then in the lab, produce, I don't know, maybe for three months in a year, produce virus, purify it, distribute it in Eppendorf's, in the small tubes, and distribute those to growers. The cost to government would have been about a dollar, a dollar fifty per tube. That is something you can afford to give to growers. What the growers then did was, after harvest, because as I said, this for, for rice at least, it was a stem borer. So you really don't want to collect insects before harvest, right? You want to collect after harvest. 
um, they sent their kids into the rice fields that were, were then dry, get the stubbles, carry them back in the field. And we did training videos on that and traveled with those and taught people how to do it. And they opened the stems and the kids, you see them sitting there, you know, peeling those stems open and getting those caterpillars out there and putting them in a plastic container. And then you have mom or dad, typically dad, coming with this Eppendorf, right? This highly scientific Eppendorf. And mix it with water, pour it over the larva that the kids had collected and let it sit there for some minutes. I don't know what we had, 10 minutes or something like that? Uh, one. One minute, or anything between one and 10 minutes. <laughs> and then pour the rest of the liquid away and then let, just let the larva sit there till the next growing season. They produce the virus until they die. And then next year, you just, and so then, you know, spin the, the film forward. The next year, you t take the larva and you mush them all up with normal kitchen equipment and put it into a bucket of water, fill the bucket of water up with water, and then take a bushel of grass and you can spray it like this over the field, like, like with a broom or so, just make some drops. When that was or where that was? When? when that was, we started in 89 and we had reached that level in 93. So the system is so flexible, you know. Again, there is no need for protection of intellectual property. I wouldn't know anybody who in, in, in Madagascar would want to, well, you don't have a system to protect intellectual property. You don't have a system to feed the people. You don't defend it. Yes. There, I can only say from our field trials, and I don't remember the numbers. I really don't. I mean, this is, is quite a while back now, but it absolutely it was very nice efficacy. It was very nice efficacy, and it was efficacy to the point that the growers were willing to accept it. Yeah. The point is growers don't want 100% efficacy in Madagascar. What they feel is that it's good when the plants are stressed, because when they are stressed, they compensate. And when they compensate, they produce more crop than if they were not stressed. So it was you know, the, the, the human factor and the biology, biology. But it was very, very, very good efficacy. It was not like a chemical, but to the grower's satisfaction. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's the most important part. You need them on your side. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, as I don't know I told to whom, but sometimes, uh, villagers from further away would come that we never had heard about and said, why did the village X got yeah. the, the, the violin? We did not. We want it now. And they are there, you know, with their <laughs> sword, <laughs> their, their spares. <laughs> yeah, you're sure. <laughs> and that this is not expensive technology. Mm -hmm. and, and probably the argument that got us the facility that we got is if you can eliminate this, if that's in the public sector, you can get this out at the end. And that's what growers can pay for. And, and I also, I think a lot of companies, I mean, this is just economics. If you have a price like this, how many are you gonna sell? If you have a price like this, how many are you going to sell? And so you're $10 a profit. You might sell 100 times more. So you got 100 times $10, and you might sell 100 times less. I don't know. There, there's a seesaw there. No, well, it's because they don't want to Not according to the, to the exactly. investors who did the financial exercise. Uh, they I, looked at 15,000 hectare mm -hmm. and looked, OK, 15,000 hectare times 50 or 15,000 hectares times 240. The, the 240 and the 250 dollars nowadays is not in jeopardy as long as it's not somebody coming with an as good product for fifty dollars but the day you start spreading the idea that you can have similar efficacy better ecological interactions for 50 bucks their 250 40 is in big jeopardy is it yeah.
build you a facility for these growing associations have money. That's a yes. workshop on its own. Well, <laughs> I have a few comments about that. In, in Europe, some of them have. And in Cuba, because it's a social system, they produce these kinds of products, not, not viruses at the moment, but they're coming. Uh, but fungi and, and um, macrobiologicals in little facilities all across the country. So the reason it's not happening here, is it political or is it just there is no reason it hasn't happened yet? I think it's, I think it's both. I think it's oh. both. When you look at what a grower needs to know to grow and sell a crop, it is so humongous. Really, it is. I, 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 I think I probably have somewhat more courage than many people do. Um, I don't think I had the courage to be a grower. Really not. There is too much you need to know. There is too much insecurity. And when you have really figured it all out, here comes the weather. <laughs> it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have the nerves so that they say, you know what? pest control guys, you are the experts, you tell me what I should be doing. I think that is what they need to do. They can't be on top of everything else, uh, on everything, or they are really not on, on top of the production system as such.